Hello. Welcome to EHS Today's webcast, Reducing Risk by Design, sponsored by PILS. My name is Dave Blanchard. I'm the Editor-in-Chief and Content Director of EHS Today. So before we start, let me just go over how you can participate in today's presentation. So first, if at any time you have audio difficulties or the slides aren't advancing, simply hit your F5 key to refresh your webcast console. If you have any technical difficulties during today's session, please press the Help button on your player console to receive assistance in solving common issues. So we're using a webinar technology that will let you resize the presentation. What you want to do to that is you click the Maximize icon, or you could just drag the lower right corner, and that should enlarge the window. We welcome your questions during today's event. So to submit your questions to today's presenter, simply type your question into the Q&A window, which you'll see on the left-hand side of your screen. Then make sure you hit the Submit button. We're going to answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A session that will follow the main presentation. But please feel free to send in your questions at any time, and we'll add them to the queue. Please also be aware that today's session is being recorded, and it will be available on the EHS Today website probably within the next week. What we'll do is we'll send you all an email letting you know once the archive has been posted. So if you have any colleagues who weren't able to be on the call, uh, they'll be able to watch that anytime in the future. You'll also see the PILS logo on your screen, and that logo actually is hotlinked. So if you'd like to visit the PILS website at any point during the webcast, just click on their logo and a new window will open up. Uh, don't worry, though, this will not take you out of the webinar. And that's it for the housekeeping tips. Let me now welcome our presenter. I'll give you a little bit of introduction. Uh, Dan Rosso has a degree in electrical technology, and he's been certified as a certified machinery safety expert by TUV Nord. Dan has nearly 10 years of machinery support and services experience in industrial autom automation applications. Dan has been with PILS Automation Safety for over three years as a safety engineer and a technical trainer. And with that, I'm going to now turn it over to Dan Rosso. Dan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dave. Hi, my name is Dan Rosso, um, and I will be your presenter today. I'm a technical trainer with PILS. So today we're going to talk about reducing risk by design. So what we're actually going to do is we're going to talk about the overall process for risk assessment and risk reduction and, and some key highlights on what you can do during those processes. So what is a risk assessment? Well, it's an overall process comprising of a risk assessment and a risk evaluation. A risk assessment is a sequence of logical steps to identify estimation, to identify hazards, estimate risks, and evaluate those associated risks. What the risk assessment is, is that it's necessary and needs to be followed by risk reduction. We have standards that can help support us with this. As you see here on the slide, the definition that I uh, read was from ISO 12100. Safety of Machinery, General Principles for Design, Risk Assessment, and Risk Reduction. There's also an ANSI standard that also supports that, which is ANSI B11.0, which covers very similar content. Throughout our risk assessment, we have a series of steps that we must go through. The first step we have to do is we need to define the limits of the machine. So what kind of machine is it? What's its spatial requirements? What's its power or energy sources? You know, what is it supposed to do? The next step we go through is the hazard identification. For each associated task that we do with a machine, whether it's for setup, cleaning, normal operation, or maintenance, there's associated hazards. So we do what we call task-based risk analysis or risk assessments. For every associated hazard, there's an associated task. One hazard may be done, may be present in multiple tasks. Now we need to go through, and after we've identified our hazards, 
We do our risk estimation. Okay. Basically, what we do with this is we determine are we willing to accept this risk or do we need to do some kind of risk reduction? So we, basically, we are doing the evaluation and the uh, estimation together. If we determine we need to do risk reduction, we can go through a process called the hierarchy of controls. For the risk estimation, we have to look at some key factors. So for the risk is a function of severity that can cause a result. So basically, it's the severity of harm, so how bad are you going to get hurt, and the probability of occurrence. So how often are you there, and what's your duration? What's the likelihood of occurrence of the event that you could get hurt, and is there a possibility to avoid it? There's different types of tools that can help you estimate these type things. You can look to a risk matrix tool, like you see here, that has probability of occurrence and severity of harm. There's other things such as graphs that will also do things that will help you do estimate risks. Or numerical tools, like we see here an example of a hazard rating number system. There are numerous standards out there that can also support this. For example, ISO 14121-2. For reducing the risk, we look to the hierarchy of controls. ANSI B11.0 and ISO 12100 both have very similar ways to reduce risk. Step one, we reduce risk by either eliminating the hazard or we substitute the hazard. So eliminate the pinch point. Just completely engineer it out. If it's a high, a high task procedure for a human, replace it with a robot. Engineer the human out. Hazardous substance, try to use and substitute it for least hazardous substance. If we're not able to engineer the hazards out, we can start going on to the second step, which are engineering controls, which are guards and safeguarding devices. So things like barriers, interlocked gates, light curtains, our complementary devices such as e-stops. Once we've gone through that to further reduce the risk, our third step is what are our administrative controls, our information for use. That's our awareness devices such as warning labels, lights, beacons, alarms. Next we get into training and procedures. So you need to be trained on the tasks that you're doing. Don't have proper training, written procedures, lockout tagout procedures. And the last thing that we do under the administrative controls is we do our PPE. So safety shoes, hard hats, safety glasses, things like that. One thing you also see on the left-hand side of the slide is you see most preferred to least preferred. That also has to do with the, about the amount of human interaction that has to do with the task. It's most preferred to do elimination and substitution because that's done at the design phase where there's no human interaction done. Down towards the bottom of the administrative controls, that's where the most human interaction can be done. And humans can also ignore their procedures. They don't, have, they don't always wear their PPE. They ignore the warning signs. So that's why the administrative controls are least preferred. Also, when reducing risk, if we have a risk that is what we consider an intolerable risk, we have a region of tolerability. Then there's also an area of acceptable region. But not every hazard that you work on will actually be reduced to that negligible region. So you need to be able to reduce the risk to what's as low as reasonably practicable. That's what the ALA stands for. You see this triangle is also written upside down. This also shows diminishing returns. So to go from a high risk to a lower risk, you will get a greater return. To go from a lower risk to an even lower, it gets harder and harder to actually reduce the risk. It'll have very minimal output 
on your final risk reduction. So here there's a flow chart that indicates our three-step method for risk reduction. We can see that we can go through inherently safe design or engineer or uh, design things out or substitution. So that's where we're going to start with our inherently safe design. Let's try to engineer a hazard out. So in order to get to our risk reduction, we have an increased risk. We have the required risk reduction. So our limit of acceptability. That limit of acceptability or limit of tolerability, both those terms are very used interchangeably when it comes to acceptability of risk, tolerability. So you have to get to that level of acceptability. You can actually achieve greater than that level of acceptability, but there will always be a residual risk. No machine is 100% safe. So no matter what kind of risk you have, there will always be some kind of a minimal residual risk. Now how you get to that actual risk reduction with that residual risk is completely up to you. You have multiple options. Risk reduction from other measures, guarding, engineering things out, administrative controls, a little bit from safety related parts of the control systems, your safety controls, you know, gate interlocks, light curtains, scanners, your safety PLCs, things like that. Or you depend a little bit on other risk reduction measures, so guarding, administrative controls, engineering things out. And you depend a lot on a control system, a safety control system. So there's no one way to safeguard a machine. So the first thing we can look at is the elimination. So we can eliminate the hazard. So in this case, you see a wheel on the left that has four spokes. If I were to put my hand through there, I could possibly get some kind of broken bones or possibly even a amputation based off a hard surface on the, on the back side of that rotating cog. Well, to engineer out that hazard, let's use a cog that's got a solid wheel in the middle. Can't put your fingers through it. You eliminated the hazard. Next thing we can look at is safeguarding and the use of complementary devices. So here we see a press. There are multiple types of guarding used here. We have fixed guarding on the side there. We have a movable guard that is actually mechanically interlocked with the clutch brake on top. So if we open the mechanical guard in the front, it disengages the clutch so the press cannot operate. So there's different kinds of guards that are out there available to us to do risk reduction. Those can be found in ISO 14120, general requirements for design of fixed and movable guards. There also can be found in ANSI B1119, for the requirements here for the United States. So there's different kinds of guards that are available to us. We have fixed guards, whether they're in closing or distance. There's movable guards that could be manually operated, power operated, guards that are self-closing, a control guard, there's interlock guards along with interlock guards with guard locking, or adjustable guards. In general requirements for guarding, should be able to climb on them based off their design. You need to have adequate view to be able to look through them based off the type of material and the application that you're using. You should be able to reach through them, around them, over them. You need to be able to verify that the measurements that you take and where you place the guards are adequate based off other standards or even safety distance tables, whether it's high risk or low risk. Typically in the manufacturing world for machines, we use high risk type table. So 
So fixed guards should be permanently welded in place, can be held in with fasteners such as bolts, shouldn't be able to be removed with the use of a, a, a coin or a nail file. These can either be in closing or distance. So here, here we see an example of a closing guard. It is a motor with some kind of a rotating uh, apparatus on the other end. So here it might have be a chain and sprocket or a belt and cog. We're able to enclose that so we can't put our fingers in to get caught up inside either the chain and sprocket or belt and cog. The distance guard we see here around this robot. We're not able to reach over the fence to be able to reach the robot as it's moving around doing its task. So here we see the low risk table for reaching over. This table and the high risk table can be found in ISO 13857. So what we look at is the height of the hazard, which is our A, the height of the protective structure, which is our B, and we go through based off the, those two distances and wherever they intersect is the distance that must be done between the hazard and the protective structure. If you don't have enough room between there, you don't have the amount of space that you need to have, you can always increase the height of the guard to decrease that safe distance. Guard openings, things typically you can find here. Uh, this should be clear visible, like we had mentioned, like I mentioned before. Um, watch the colors of the guarding. Some bright neon colors sometimes can be very hard to see through. So a lot of times in a normal manufacturing facility, I have seen a lot of yellow frames with a black mesh. Makes it very easy to look through and to troubleshoot and to see the process. Um, other aids that might help you in determining uh, safe distance are the guard opening requirements that you can find in ISO 13857. There's a similar table in B11.19. And OSHA actually has some in 19.217. So each system varies a little bit depending on the type of machine you're working with and where you're located in the world. But all provide safe distances. 13857 also provides support for hazards that you might be able to reach through depending on the size of the opening, whether it's a slot, square, or it's round, and what part of the body can reach through it depends on the safety distance. So here you can see the openings, and then to the left of that, I'm sorry, to the right of that, you are able to see the minimum distance based off a slot, square, or if it is round. So here, a lot of times, you may have to reach into a machine to make some kind of quick adjustment while the machine is running. So here, they actually allow for partial guarding to limit the motion of the arm. This can also be found in 13857. There's also a table in 13857 that limits the access of the lower limbs. So depending on the tip of the toe all the way up to the full leg. Depending on the size of the opening and its shape, depends on how far the distance is you are allowed to put your feet, uh, foot or leg in. One thing you do have to watch is that any opening that can be considered that is slotted that is 180 millimeters and or a square or round opening that is 240 so if the slot is 240 by 180, or if the opening is 240 millimeters, whether it's a square or a round, full body access per 13857 is granted. So you may have to be able to watch to not be able to permit full body access, somebody being able to slide in between two pieces of fencing, or slide underneath the fence if the fencing is too far off the floor. 1357 does allow a sweep height under the guard of 180 millimeters, which does align with ANSI B1119, which is 
7 inches. Other types of guards we have available to us are movable guards, typically hinged to some kind of fixed uh, guard. It could, it could also slide. Uh, typically open without the use of tools. They can be power operated, self-closing. It can also be what's called a control guard. So these are typically the most popular guards is that once we have a movable guard, typically they are interlocked. So here we have some mechanical guards. So here we have a chop saw or a miter saw as you might call it. So as you bring the saw down, the guard goes up. And as you raise the blade back up, the guard goes down. And the press that we had mentioned earlier, the front guard is movable, but is mechanically linked to the clutch. So the clutch will not be able to operate while the machine, while the machine front guard is open. We have adjustable guards. Uh, restrict access where it's strictly necessary. Typically, this is done either manually or automatically. Uh, the biggest risk reduction for this is ejection of parts from the inside of the uh, cell. It shouldn't be able to be easily removed um, and easily adjustable without the use of a tool. But one thing that I've seen in industry is that a lot of times people on plant floors this is one of the things they neglect as an operator, that human interaction that you have to depend on as an administrative control. Yeah. Interlocking guards, typically associated with a movable guard. They typically operate when the guard is closed. And when they are open, it gives a stop command to the machine. But when you close the guard, or an interlocked guard, as part of the safety system, it should not itself restart the hazardous motion on the inside of the machine. You should, also be, you should not be able to open the interlock guard and be able to walk in and get to the hazardous motion also. So there's one of two things you can do with that. You can either increase the safe distance between the hazard and the interlocked gate, Or, as we come up to it, we have a couple examples here of interlocked guarding on a fence or on a CNC type blaze. Or, to increase that safe distance, to maintain that safe distance you already have, make sure you can't get to the hazard, you need to lock the gate. So you can have an interlocked gate with guard locking. So it prevents you from getting into the dangerous zone. While the hazard is still active, once the hazard has been reduced to zero energy, then the gate should unlock and allow full access. This can, you know, there are several ways to monitor it. You know, if your feedback switches, you can use a safe timer. If you know the machine will shut down in two seconds, you can set a timer for five seconds. Um, other times, you might have to have some kind of an encoder, because things may have a long run down time. So it's better to do a safe controlled stop than let, than let a hazard sit there and just freewheel with removing power. So here we have a robot with an interlocked guard on it. The robot may take some additional time to slow down, so we will keep the gate locked until the robot comes to zero, to, uh, zero state energy. Other things we may have to do to incorporate just things like gate interlocks is uh, we may have to use safety controls. There's actually an intuitive process to design safety-related parts of the control system. So here we can outline the process is that for each safety function, so for every gate interlock, for every laser scanner, for every light curtain, we have to identify what it's supposed to do for the machine. What is its function for the machine? So we have to write a safety requirement specification. Okay. We need to determine the performance level required, our PLR, for that specific hazard that we are using that safeguarding technique, such as a laser scanner or an interlocked gate, to protect against. 
we can go through and then design and pick our components based off our PLR. We can choose our category along with other reliability data that we need to look at while analyzing our functions. So we can pick our components and design our circuit. From there, what we need to do is do a comparison between the performance level that we required in our risk assessment to what we actually designed, which our final performance level is. If you didn't meet the requirements of the PLR, you need to go back and look at your design. Maybe select different components or redesign your circuit. And there you need to go through and validate all your requirements. Did they meet the required characteristics that you specified? Then have all the safety functions been analyzed? If the machine doesn't have doesn't match the specification from the beginning, either the scope changed and it wasn't documented, or the machine wasn't designed properly. To determine performance level required, you can turn to the, one of the annexes in ISO 13849-1, which has to deal with the safety related parts of the control system uh, for the safety design. So we can use three parameters, such as severity of injury, frequency and duration of exposure, and the possibility of avoidance. So here we get performance levels A, B, C, D, and E. To help make up those performance levels, we are allowed to choose some different types of architecture for our circuits to meet the requirements of our performance levels. We have five different types of architecture. Uh, we have category B and category 1, which are both comprised of component selection and application specific proven principles, which are both single channel. Category 2 which is comprised of application and structural measures, which is single channel with testing. So the control system and or manual testing of the control system. And category three and four are characterized by application and structural measures. These two are redundant with fault detection and comparison. So these two are dual channel. Here's some simple representation of our architectures. Category B and 1, you got category 2, where your logic and your output are being tested by the logic. And you have a secondary channel to shut the machine down, depending on your performance level. Categories 3 and 4 are nearly identical between the channel 1 and channel 2 is that category three allows for between 60 and 99% diagnostic coverage, or category four mandates 99% diagnostic coverage for the whole circuit. So to, to respectively achieve our performance level, we need to look at the severity of the injury, frequency of exposure, and your duration, along with the ability to avoid and or possibly the probability of occurrence. That's our PLRL, PLR. Our final performance level, we need to look at the architecture we selected. We need to look at our fault detection mechanisms, such as diagnostic coverage, common cause failures, which is good, typically good engineering practices. The reliability of the components, when are the components going to fail? Our MTTFD, the mean time to dangerous failure of each component. Safety related software if required. That could be the firmware on the safety relay, the firmware on the safety PLC, or the safety PLC program. Those also, those two also need to be verified. Any kind of systematic failures, such as human error, you specified it wrong, you depict the wrong components. And any environmental and operating conditions. Is it, is it warm outside during the summer and makes it a lot warmer in the electrical cabinets? Is it cold outside? What about the humidity, vibration? Any one of those can be considered environmental or operating conditions. All those must be analyzed 
meet our performance level. So here we see a graph that ties our performance level and what architecture each performance level can achieve based off the diagnostic coverage and the mean time to dangerous failure for the components. Some of the safety components we have available to us that are available in safety control systems. So here, safety components are independently placed on the market, the failure and the malfunction, which end the danger of the process. Not necessary in order to, for the machine to function, or for which normal components may be substituted in order for the machine to function. So typically, the safety control system is separate from the main control system. That's how, that's how it has been for a long time, but until now, newer PLCs are actually integrating the safety PLCs together, the standard control and the safe control into one processor. So we have our interlocking devices, like I mentioned before. They can be mechanical, electrical. I've seen optical ones before um, that are generally operating under specific conditions. They can be interlocking or interlocking with guard locking. So here, if we use mechanical type switches, they need to be uh, activated in the positive mode, and we don't depend on the switch, or on the, I'm sorry, we don't depend on the spring to actuate the actuator. There's direct mechanical action that needs to happen. So when the actuator opens, the contacts need to be forced open. And in this case, if the spring were to break, the contacts would remain open in a safe state. So if we have direct, that direct mechanical action, it'll be a, the switch will have that little arrow you see there on the left. Well, here's an example of interlocking devices. They can be magnetic, that are non-contact. They can be RFID, non-contact. Here we have an example of a mechanical switch. Um, even now, there are uh, RFID type switches that have guard locking. It's where in the tongue, it's RFID. But if the tongue breaks, the RFID tag breaks and no longer is interlocked. We have optoelectrical, optoelectric sensors, such as light curtains, laser scanners, safe vision systems. So depending on the application, depends on what technology you might be able to use, typically used for regular access to, for material to pass through. Now you can, with a laser scanner, you can do large, complex shapes. Um, they're also used on AGV systems, automated guided vehicles, so that they become very widely popular. So here we have an example of a vision system, the 3D camera, virtually a three-dimensional laser scanner. It measures tape and all measures in three dimensions. And it can also eliminate the need for mechanical guarding. We have two-hand controls. There's three different types of two-hand controls, type one, type two, type three. Two-hand controls are used to protect the operator only. Other safeguards may have to be used to protect everybody else. So a lot of times you'll see on, say, a press or a press break. Two-hand control for the operator to keep their hands out of the operation in combination with a light curtain. Two hand controls for the operator, the light curtain, and physical guarding are for everybody else. So here we have pressure sensitive mats. So if you were to step on the mat, it would actually trigger the safety system and would cause it to shut, the machine to shut off. Um, but they are easily damaged. Here we also have laser scanners. Um, they're very good. They can typically do all up to about 270, 280 degrees of access. They can provide two different detection zones, a warning and a detection, operate in two dimensions, and a time of flight principle. Other things we can look at are our complementary devices, such as emergency stops. Here, our e-stops also need to act, activate in the positive 
mode. When you push them, they should latch. They need to either be pulled or twisted to unlock them back to the original state. But resetting the e-stop should not initiate a restart of the machine or the hazardous motion. You should have to reset the e-stop button, reset the control system, and then start the machine again. Based off, there's different categories of stops that we can use that you can find in IEC 60204-1 or NFPA 79. Our category 1 is an uncontrolled stop. It's an immediate removal of power of the output actuators. We have a category 1 stop. It's what we call a controlled stop. It's where we use the energy to bring the motion, the hazardous motion, to a safe state, and then the power is removed. So if you had a high inertial load and you had, say, DC braking through a VFD or a servo drive, you'd be able to use that braking to bring it to a safe state quicker than doing an uncontrolled stop. And there's also what we call a Category 2 stop, where power is actually available to the machine actuators. It's still left on. Well, for emergency stop, we're only allowed Category 0 and Category 1. But for Category 1 emergency stops, you may still have to use safe distances or things like guard blocking to make sure the operators can't get in to the hazardous condition until it is stopped, even under an emergency condition. So emergency stop actuators should be palm or mushroom shaped and only be actuated by the palm. They can be wires or ropes, foot pedals without guarding on it. It can be handbars. The actuator must be red and the background must be yellow. Okay. Then we can start getting into our safety control systems. As part of our safety control systems, um, we have relays, which are suitable for levels of safety of lower complexity. Then there's multiple types of safety PLCs. There's very simple ones out there, and then there's very complex. They're extremely flexible with a very high diagnostic value. There's also safety field bus systems for uh, safety PLCs with distributed I.O. So you have the decentralized network of inputs and outputs. Along with our safety actuators, our safety rated drives, safety rated contactors, things associated with that. So here's an example of a safety PLC system. So you can see that we have a processor right here in the middle along with distributed I.O. points, through e-stops, gate interlocks, throughout a whole, whole machine. And last but not least, in our risk reduction, we have our administrative controls, our information for use. So here, this is where we start looking at things like putting warning labels on a guard saying, hey, if you remove this guard, there's going to be a hazard behind there. Our SOPs, our safe operating procedures, our standard operating procedures. It's a procedure written to tell operators, maintenance, contractors, how to properly do a task, blackout tagout procedures, how to isolate energy, along with PPE. Do I need safety glasses? Do I need safety shoes, hearing protection? These are all things that need to be based off the risks that are assessed in the risk assessment. As I was just saying, information for use shall not be a substitute for the correct application of inherently safe design, safeguarding our complementary protective measures. Remember, PPE and your administrative controls are always the last step in risk reduction. It is not the first. People always like to be reactive. Oh, we can just use PPE. No, you don't always want to be reactive. You want to be proactive. What is causing these hazards? A lot of people were just react instead of actually being proactive and digging into the source 
of why incidents keep happening. And last but not least, after we go through and we implement all our safeguards, we want to go through and do a final safety validation. This can be testing along with analysis, um, for guarding, along with the safe operation of our safety control system. So the purpose, we need to make sure everything is properly implemented. Is it designed properly? Are they operating function, operating properly and functioning properly based off our design? So based off the tasks, we need to go through for our vinyl you know, safety design validation. You know, if we're going through, we need to make sure the guards are durable enough. Are they properly mounted um, based off things like light curtains or laser scanners? Do we have a, did we calculate out the safe distance properly? You know, for the electrical control, for hydraulics, pneumatics, if they're tied into a safety control system, do they meet the performance level required based off their design? We do another theoretical type analysis. Then we actually go through, test the system as it should. If I push an e-stop, will the contactor open? Will the pneumatic valve dump? But we also want to go through and test that safety control system under the fault conditions that it is meant to, do, to operate under. Short the, two wire, short the dual channel system together. Pull a wire off the e-stop to see if the safety control system sees it. We'll make sure it can operate properly under the fault conditions. And then you know, that's part of your functional testing. You want to uh, review the machine risks. Talk about the guarding, the control system, any electrical or fluid power. I do the functional testing. And from there, uh, if you guys have any questions, I will go ahead and kick it back over to Dave, who may have some questions. Uh, we do have questions. Uh, first of all, thank you, Dan. That was a great presentation. I uh, appreciate that. And uh, we have a lot of folks, and I, I'm looking at the screen right now, a number of, I'm looking at my screen, and you folks can't see it, but uh, a lot of questions are coming through. Uh, let me just ask that while uh, Dan answers the questions that we're about to ask, please take a moment to complete the feedback form, which you should see in the lower toolbar. And what I'm going to do is just start asking some questions um, as they come in. Uh, there may be some questions that are really technical or really specific to just your operation. So we're going to forward every question to Dan. So even if we don't ask and answer it during this live webinar, he will be able to follow up with you. All right, let me start in with the questions. Um, Question number one, Dan, what are the main reasons that upper-level management might hesitate to support risk reduction methods? Any reasons that you hear commonly? Uh, sometimes it can be budget. Sometimes it's legal. Because once, once a company figure, finds out that they actually have a hazard or risk reduction that needs to be done in the plant, um, they can actually be held responsible for not mitigating those hazards. Per OSHA, it's the employer's responsibility to provide a safe workplace for a corporation and to make sure its employees are operating the machine safely. So it's under the OSHA law that it's on the employer to make sure you guys are operating, have safe work conditions, the machines are safe, and that you're properly trained. Okay. That, yeah, good answer for that. A um, couple questions have come through about e-stops. For instance, let me ask this one first. Uh, the question is, I have seen many types of shields for buttons to protect against accidental contact. Some of these buttons are homemade. Is there a standard or a guidance document that can help with deciding whether an e-stop shield is acceptable or not? Um, about two years ago, um, ISO 13850, which is the emergency stop standard um, used for the international, um, actually was revised and got rid of the shields. 
Um, there's guidance in there based off, if I remember correctly, the shield has to be on a diameter of 120 millimeters. Um, I, I, I see the reasoning for trying to accidental bumping and things like that. Uh, some of the suggestions I typically get is maybe change the orientation of the button. You know, if it's in a walkway and it's pointing straight out hip-wise, maybe point it straight up or have a, uh, a, pull, a pull cord rather than just having a button maybe every 10 meters or something along those lines. Um, so, you, really, you know, there is 13850, um, NFPA 79, and B1119 um, also give some guidance on that also. Very good. A little follow-up question, uh, another, well, another question about e-stop. Why can't a lockout e-stop be used? Per OSHA, it is required that all energy isolation be done by mechanical means. An e-stop circuit, depending on the age of the machine, may only be done through a standard PLC. So trusting the reliability of that may not necessarily be the best means. But per OSHA uh, 1910.147, that contactors should not be used for lockout purposes. There are, there are alternatives out there for minor servicing and possible lockout through safety control lockout systems now. All right, let's stick with the e-stops for one more question. Can we put e-stop in series and keep a CAT3 or CAT4 architecture? Yes, you can, because typically during uh, an emergency stop situation, you only push one e-stop in there. So you are able to keep the diagnostic coverage high for CAT3 or CAT4. Okay, let me get to some more questions. Um, all right, this, this person was just asking to um, for a clarification, I think. At what typical stage of risk reduction is a robot introduced to replace a human machinist? Uh, that's typically at the design phase or retrofit. You know, you could have a manual operation that you could replace the manual operation with the, with a robot. You're introducing new hazards for introducing that robot into the situation, so the risk, risk assessment should be revisited for those new introduced hazards. Um, but typically, if you're trying to integrate a robot, that's at the design phase or retrofit. If you're at that at that point, at that point. Okay. Can you name any companies? that you know of that have instituted uh, successful risk reduction of the types that you've been talking about? I guess they're just asking for any case studies or um, examples of companies who are doing the types of things you're talking about. Um, as a uh, in safety consultant and trainer, um, we have our customers that we do it with all the time. I'm not allowed to give those names out, but you know, there's a lot of large international corporations that do risk reduction all the time. Um, there's a lot of OSHA studies out there, um, you know, that talk about it. So um, I wish I could give that information out, but I can't. <laughs> okay. No, we understand. I, um, let me let me shift gears a little bit. Uh, there, actually, there's a number of of companies. I, I understand Dan's hesitancy, and I respect his his answer. Uh, you can check ehstoday.com's website or just Google uh, the types of specific questions. I think you'll probably find there are a number of case studies that have been published out there. Uh, di different question now. What are some of the standards for door interlock keys? Is there any situation that would allow a technical associate to use a door interlock key to work on a machine while it's in auto mode? Uh, typically, you know, if you want to go into some kind of automatic mode for troubleshooting, um, you need to assess the risks associated with the machine. Um, so everything's going to be based off the risk assessment. But yeah, I have seen trap key systems or overrides programmed into systems or override switches, um, but it typically reduces the amount of risk. Um, they typically don't run in full speed. Um, if you do, um, it just you have to assess the hazards associated with the with the situation. It's all application specific. Okay, thanks. And 
quick question, I guess, maybe not a quick answer, is, is risk assessment an OSHA requirement? OSHA does not specify that thou shall do a risk assessment, like unlike the machinery directive in Europe that says that you have to do a risk assessment. Um, OSHA does says that the end that the employer has to pr provide a workplace of free from recognizable in uh, hazards and protect their employees from those hazards. Um, a lot of the supporting uh, consensus standards that ANSI can still cite you on under the General's Duty Clause, such as the ANSI B11 series, those consensus standards do say that you should do a risk assessment. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Uh, I'm just trying to really re read these questions quickly to get the gist for them. When we need to use a safety warning or caution label, or I guess when do we need to use safety labels on machines? For example, do we need to use them on fixed guard? Do fixed guards need a safety label? I guess the question is just when do you need to use these safety warning labels on the machinery? You know, a lot of times if you have fixed guards that are never removed, um, I tend not to use them. But if I have a fixed guard that may have a chain and sprocket underneath it that may need required maintenance, it's just kind of a, another indication that a hazard arises underneath that guard. So it's kind of application specific. Um, or, you know, if there's like a big laser inside of a machine, um, you don't want to look in certain areas, you know, even if you may be exposed. So it just depends on the hazard and uh, the amount of frequency and exposure you are to that hazard. Okay. Uh, this would be a good time for me to remind all those of you who are uh, on silent mode out there in, uh, in Q&A land that you have a couple more minutes if you want to submit a question. Uh, we'll try to get to it uh, before we wrap up the live portion of the webinar. So let me then ask another question. Excuse me while I flip through these real quick. Um, do safe interlocking guards need safety label? I guess follow up on the safety label question. Do safe interlocking guards need a safety label? Uh, it's, a lot of times it's better to inform and warn. So, you know, if you open the interlock gate, you may want to inform the operators, what kind of hazards are on the other side if they're not able to have a clear line of sight. Um, so, you know, the operator shouldn't be able, you know, shouldn't be walking into a machine or maintenance techs or whoever's walking into a machine or opening the interlocked gate. Um, they should be aware of what's going on the inside. So whether it's done through training or, or labels, you know, an SOP may indicate out what's going on with the machine hazard-wise. So. Any one of them could be used. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll answer this question myself because the question was just asking about uh, will a recording of the presentation be available later? Yes, uh, next week we should have it uh, posted to the EHS Today website. Everybody who pre-registered will get an email telling you exactly when, and that web webinar will be uh, available on demand for the next year once it's posted. So yeah, you've got plenty of time uh, coming up to uh, listen to Dan's presentation. Another question, are interlocks an acceptable means of protection when employees are doing adjustments or routine tasks? Uh, OSHA does have the um, minor servicing clause under 1910-147. So if you're in there doing a minor task that's routine, repetitive, and integral of production, uh, as long as it's based off the risk assessment and justified, it could be yes. Just needs to be justified with the risk assessment and meet those requirements. Okay, another quick question: uh, Do you need guarding when you're using interactive robots? Uh, it depends on the type of what you're trying to describe as an interactive robot. If you're describing something along the lines of an industrial robot, yes, typical traditional guarding needs to be used. If you're talking about what we call cobots or the collaborative robots nowadays, that is all based off a of risk assessment and the amount of force and torque that you're allowed to impact your body. There's a standard out there, ISO 15066, that specializes 
um, on the collaborative application of collaborative robots, um, but it, they're kind of their own little niche in robotics because it doesn't require traditional safeguarding, um, but it may based off the risk assessment and the amount of speed that needs to be done based off force and pressure. Um, so. Yeah, I think that's going to be a fascinating thing to watch in the years to come. As I mean, we're, we're only seeing the beginning of of the age of robotics, so it'll be interesting to see how this all develops. Oh yeah. Um, if you look in the archive on EHS website, I actually did a webinar a few months back on collaborative applications. So maybe look that up. Awesome, awesome. Uh, let's see. We've got a couple more minutes. I'll ask at least one or two more questions. So the question is, we have hundreds of machines in our plant. What's the best way of selecting where to start risk assessments? So how, how do you get started? Um, a lot of times what uh, I've seen pills do is that we're able to go through and do kind of a high-level snapshot, you know, spend 5 to 10, 15 minutes on a machine, identify the main hazards, kind of give those main hazards a rank, and then you know, move on to the next machine. And based off what we can see in that, you know, 5 to 10 minute analysis, we're able to go through and decide where we need to do a deep dive down from there. So. You know, based off electrical, you know, just the things we observe in that 10-minute observation, um, we have developed a system that we allow us to go through and rank things um, and help us prioritize what machines get attention first and not. So there are techniques out there that can help you do that. Okay, thank you for that. Uh... I think we're going to wrap it up here. There's a couple of other questions, but there's, they seem to be specific or they're, uh, they're targeted just for uh, uh, applications that Dan might be able to follow up with, with you folks offline on to get a little bit more involved with that. Let me ask everybody, if you registered for this webinar as a group, a group of folks, uh, please add the names and emails of everybody who was in attendance on the exit survey, which should be appearing on your screen. So we have run out of time. Let me once again thank our presenter, Dan Rossow, and our sponsor, Pills. Uh, I was extremely impressed not only by Dan's presentation, but uh, how deftly you were able to answer all these questions. I just kept throwing them at you one after another, and you didn't, you didn't miss a beat, Dan, so uh, well done. Uh, so on behalf of EHS Today, our thanks again to Dan and to Pills. I'm Dave Blanchard. Have a great day, everybody.